Welcome to the Super Sentai Brothers. This is episode 36 of A View to a Cocker Ranger, the internet's best and only podcast dedicated to Ninja Sentai Cocker Ranger. Each week, well, most weeks, uh, we watch an episode <laughs> of the show and we share our thoughts with you, the listeners. Back in the saddle again, my name is Matt J, and with me as always is my co-host and brother Dave. Dave, how you doing today? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm glad to hear it. It, you know, it feels yeah. good to be back. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was weird not doing an episode. Although, hey, big thanks to Mark and Brian. Oh yeah, for stepping absolutely. in. Uh, that was a great episode, guys. Really enjoyed it. But yeah, it was very strange for me. You know what it was? It wasn't weird to like not do it. But now that we are doing it i'm like oh we haven't done this and it's been like what two weeks like oh we haven't done this in two weeks it's actually a little bit weird the the weird moment for me is when i looked at my podcast feed last week and a new episode appeared and i thought wait a second i have no (laughs) memory of this (laughs) but again uh mark and brian thank you very much that was tons of fun um they, by the way, if you have not listened to it, they watched the first episode of the Toei Marvel co-production of Japanese Spider-Man from the 70s. Yeah, which itself is boy howdy. Oh, yeah. Uh, but we're not going to talk about that. If you want to hear about that, uh, you should have called in last week when they were talking about Spider-Man. <laughs> uh, anyway, this week... We are talking about Ninja Sentai Kaka Ranger episode 36, titled The Hooligan Ninja. But before we get into that, Dave, shining in the heavens, there are five stars. What? What a what is our first star of the week? So, Matt, our first star of the week is, it's the first week of June, and that means that I'm on summer vacation. I'm on summer vacation. Well, okay, technically summer vacation starts tomorrow because it's still the weekend. Well, I mean, you didn't like, go to work today, did you? Well, no, but it's it's the weekend, so it doesn't count. Like, regardless of whether there was school or not, I wouldn't have been at work today. So on Monday, that's when summer vacation, like, really for real starts. That is, that sounds very exciting for you. Yeah, dude, I, um, this I think is like a mental defense mechanism. I sometimes forget how great summer vacation is. Because I think if I remembered maybe how great it was, then the rest of my school, like the actual school year where I do my job, where I do all the hours that get me summer vacation would be much more difficult. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but now I'm on summer vacation and uh, yeah, man, it's just like, oh, oh, like there's just it goes down to your soul. Dude, I, I know how you feel, man. I mean, I have not had a summer vacation in a long time, and actually tomorrow is my first day back in the office for two weeks. Or, Ooh, you know, bummer. I'm sorry. It is my first day back in the office after two weeks. After two weeks of vacation. No, no, no. I know what you mean. Yeah, that's the thing, is you might you might think, like, because so many things that you enjoy as a kid, like, once you get older, you're like, oh, that actually, like, wasn't that actually wasn't very good. Like, I didn't dig that thing as much as I as much as much I used to. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions. Super Sentai, just as good, if not better, actually, as an adult than as a child. And Summer Vacation, like, it, like every bit is good. Every bit is good as an adult. And, and you know, it was you know what also Maybe is... Maybe better again. Dave, you know what also is just as good as it used to be? What? Uh, that exact thing, which you said last year at the beginning of Summer Vacation. Hey, listen, man. Uh, there are truths that need to be spoken in this world, and they don't maybe get said enough. And so, uh, you know, the only response is just say them again, like, because they're so manifestly true. So I am on Summer Vacation. I'm like, listen, I'm going to be crazy busy. I'm, I'm fostering twins, and I have like a ton of house projects to do. Like, it's I'm not going to be like... Chilling out, playing video games twenty four seven. But I am I am looking forward to a a restful and productive 
summer vacation. What? Very excited. Yeah. What Wait, man is Dave, Before we move on from summer vacation, I got to ask: Do Yo. you have your summer vacation mohawk? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Without question. Nice. I'll send you a picture of it. You can post it on Twitter. If you if you've never listened to the show before, or you're just kind of new and you've picked it up since last summer, I cut a mohawk every summer and I wear it for like half the summer. I let it grow in, but it's like, so like when school year starts, I I have like a full head of hair again. But I do show up to the last week of like the final day of classes and then finals week. I have a mohawk, and it's uh, I get a big kick out. Hey, listen. I just dig it. Like if I if I felt like it was more professional, I would probably just wear it all the time because I think it looks good on me. Mm-hmm. But uh, but I don't. I only wear it for summer. But you can always tell like which kids have had me before, like which kids I've had for previous years, or which kids have never had me in a class before. Because when they show up and I have a mohawk, like they pretty they kind of lose it. Because like as a like I'm pretty straight laced. Like I always wear like a shirt and a tie and like dress shoes and blah. Oh yeah. And so uh, and so when I show up with a mohawk, the kids the kids really dig it, and I dig it. I have a good shaped head for it. You do. I think. You have a good shaped mohawk head. I am not similarly blessed, but uh, you've you've got one of the good ones. Yeah, lucked out. I lucked out. Uh, so Matt, what is our second star of the week? Second star of the week is uh, the reason that we did not have an episode last week, and I've alluded to it earlier in this episode is that I just got back. From uh, essentially a two-week vacation. Um, I left the Monday before last, um, and then I just got home last night, and today is Sunday. So I was visiting our parents and our sister, actually, also, in Sweden. Um, and, the, yeah. and the part of Sweden where they live is right next to Denmark. Like, you can just hop on a quick train and go over to Copenhagen. Yeah, it's like, it's literally across, like, a very narrow... Because they live in... The city they live in is called Malmö, and it's, I think it's, like, the southernmost point of Sweden. And, yeah, it's like a 20-minute underground uh, railroad, like, ferry ride across into Copenhagen. Yeah, they live closer to Copenhagen. It is faster for them to get to Copenhagen than it is for me to get to the east side of Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's true. And actually. I will say, listen, the East Side of Cleveland is fun, but uh, it's no Copenhagen. It's not Copenhagen. Copenhagen has its own little uh, amusement park that I did not go to. Oh no, kidding! We didn't go to it either. Yeah. So you you were visiting them? What was it? Two years ago? Uh, yeah, it would have been two years ago. And what is funny is that I think in many ways we kind of had the same vacation. Like we were there for about mm-hmm. the same amount of time, and I think we did kind of most of the same things. Yeah, uh, mom and dad have kind of, at this point, (laughs) they've sort of figured out, like, the circuit. Like, they kind of know how many things you can comfortably do in, like, a particular period of time. And, like, through trial and error, they figured out, like, kind of the coolest stuff. And so I was following your trip as, as, like, you were, like, posting pictures to, like, Twitter and email and stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Oh, yeah, I remember that, too. Yeah, I, and I think a few of these things we only went to because before you went, um, you had looked up some things to do. So, like, we went to go visit this Viking village, and I think the first time that Mom and Dad had gone to that Viking village was with you and Beth. Hey, that Viking village, yes. very cool. Yeah, photo beacon, it's super, super cool. Uh, it totally just looks like you're wandering around the inside of Skyrim, which I know is the point it- of Skyrim. <laughs> But, like, when you are there and looking around and you come across, like, the blacksmith shop, you're like, oh, right, this is where you make the ingots. Yeah, um, the thing that I dug about Photo Beacon and I guess about Skyrim is that whoever did the art direction for Skyrim, like, they clearly did some pretty good research. Like, you're walking around and you're like, yep, this is exactly what this thing is supposed to look like. This is amazing. It was very, very good. Um... There, there were a few, like, specific things I wanted to talk about, but the, the general second star of the week is just that I don't go on many vacations because I always end up saving up my vacation time to, like, use in one big chunk like this, and so I can mm-hmm. kind of only do it once a year. Uh, but boy, oh boy, dude, taking a two-week vacation, especially going to Europe, because I hadn't been to Europe in about 10 years. Um, mm-hmm. It was just so nice. It was so great to, you know, like... See the family, which is weird because I had not visited mom and dad in Europe since they moved, right? Which is about five yeah. years ago. 
Yeah, they, which is I kind of forget actually how long they've been they've been gone, but yeah, but the, yeah, about five years. One of the weirdest things about it was that when I got to their apartment, all of the stuff that was in their apartment is for the most part stuff that used to be in the house that I grew up in. <laughs> but like, yeah, it's a little weird. But like, you know, you forget about that stuff, like the weird, like you know, like some art that was on the walls and like the like the blue plastic cups and stuff that were like part of your life and then you don't see them for five years and then you open a cabinet in Sweden and all of a sudden like there is a thing that you had been using since you were a child and it's it was a weird weird moment yeah there is some sort of mental whiplash that that came alongside of that so Matt what um third star just kind of like what did you anything like cool you want to tell everybody about okay so here here just a few a few observations from my trip okay first of all hit it uh point one i i just have these written written down on a list here uh in photo Vican, there was a guy who was like weaving baskets and they were very cool baskets okay he was like hey you know i we're, all the people who are there are like crafts people so you yeah. show up and you yeah, talk to yeah, them yeah. and they tell you about the craft that they're doing. And this dude, he was like, "Oh, this... really? They talked to you?" Well, we talked to them and they responded. Oh wow! No, we tried to talk to them and they were very like they answered our questions like very quickly, and then we got very weird looks as to like, like why are you talking to me? Like this is Sweden. We don't talk to strangers, <laughs> even if like we're in a zone where we very clearly should be talking to people. Like we're not. We're not going to do that. You know, like I'm pretty much just here to weave baskets. I, I think that we had the benefit of going early in the season, so they had not gotten sick of people asking them the same three questions. Uh. <laughs> because when you went, I think it was in August, and we were there in like late May, early June. Um, so I talked to this basket weaver, and he's like, oh, yeah, you know, we weave the baskets. And then I looked at and he was this super soft-spoken, gentle, like, you know, like this sort of guy who you can imagine going to a viking village but being the basket weaver you know like he's not the Mm -hmm. smith he's not the tanner he's the basket weaver and he's right totally sweet like wonderful dude and i look at his hands and then i notice that his hands are covered in like heavy metal tattoos and I nice. realized, like, oh, yeah, of course, even if you're the basket weaver, if you're, like, a guy in your 20s and you're hanging out at a Viking village, you're probably really into metal. And it's just, just this really yeah. wonderful moment. <laughs> and he's also, well, he's also Swedish, Matt. So you, like, there's, like, a better than average chance that anybody you meet is, like, super into metal. Like, they're, they dig it there. Well, you know, the, the only music things that I really experienced are, one, I went to, like, a jam session with my dad where he played banjo with a bunch of uh, Swedish people. I mean, they weren't also playing banjo. They were playing, like, guitars and mandolins and stuff. But it's just a bunch of, like, do like, you know. Yeah, dad. Working dudes. Dad somehow managed to find, right, like a, like a bluegrass jam group in Sweden? Yeah, so I went to the, the bluegrass jam group. Uh, and that was the one music experience I had. The other one is that at one point we were going to Copenhagen. And it turns out that we were accidentally going there on the same night as like a big like EDM festival or concert. Oh. And here, oh. here are the things that you need to know about that. First of all, like you can get around it, right? Like it was in this one square. And if you just go to a different part of town, it's okay. Um, like you're good. The okay. other thing... Well, the other thing you need to know about it is that in Denmark, the legal drinking age is 16, and I'm pretty sure they don't have open container laws, because there was just, like, an army of drunk children wandering the streets of Copenhagen, and we just, like, we, (sighs) like, we just kept, it it took us a couple of blocks to figure out a direction that we could go. We were, we were not surrounded by them. Just, like, imagine a... A 16 or 17 year old Danish teen, like drinking warm vodka straight out of the bottle and then trying to like wash it back with a box of generic juice that he had clearly gotten at like the dollar store. Oh, that 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 is what was happening all around us. 
So no, I can admit, always like, great and like wonderful and calm and beautiful up in that part of the world. But it, I, uh, it was yeah, kind you, well, of fun to sort of be adjacent to that to see like that part of it. Well, you know, Matt, uh, the youth, the youth have an energy. And uh, sometimes, sometimes that energy is great to be around. Sometimes it is, Dave. It, sometimes it is. Uh, sometimes it's, it's truly a delight and it keeps you young. So, uh, Matt, anything else? Anything else about this like totally cool vacation you were able to take? Oh, gosh. I mean, we went to this island called Ven and we rode our bikes all around it. Like, there's not much there except for bike paths. And it, it used to be owned by um, Tycho Brahe, the astronomer. Um, and that's oh. like where he had his that's astronomy castle that I don't think is there anymore, but it's just a beautiful island and we rode bikes on it. Uh, nice. we went to the Carls, we went to the Carlsberg brewery and saw the history of the Carlsberg brew, which listen, Carlsberg is not my favorite beer, but if you, okay, it is a hot tip because this is an experience I also had at the Heineken brewery like 10 years ago in Amsterdam. I was just going to ask. Yeah, if there's ever a beer and you wonder, like, why do so many people drink this beer? Or how has it survived this long? And you have a chance to take a tour of its brewery and, like, drink the beer that is being made there, like, in that building or, you know, in adjacent building or whatever. Absolutely mm-hmm. do it. Because, like, stuff like that doesn't always transport 100% well. And also, you just get a better appreciation for it having just gone through a museum of like the history of the thing or how they make it and so forth like it's really if you are a beer person at all like go go to those brewery tours because they give you a sort of different perspective on a beer that you otherwise might uh might disregard um let's see let me look at my list here i went to a castle i saw some cool swords um oh on the flight back they decided that the in-flight movie was going to be gravity which seems which was a really awful idea because the mo- yeah that doesn't seem like a cool movie to watch on a plane i hadn't seen gravity but in gravity there are at least like three or four separate airborne disasters and crashes <laughs> so like every time i would stop like playing a game on my phone to look up at the tv i would just see another like spaceship either crashing through the atmosphere or colliding with something else midair. So that was that was fun and cool. Yeah, that doesn't seem like a great thing, uh, but, you know, yeah. whatever. But in general, uh, listen, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you, like, every detail of my vacation and then make you watch, like, a moment-by-moment slideshow. Uh, but it was a great time. I'm very glad to have gone. It's nice to be back. It's nice to be back on the show. Dave, what is our fourth Star of the Week? So, our fourth star of the week, Matt, is, dude, you probably haven't, but have you seen any episodes of The Crown on Netflix? Like, the biopic about Queen Elizabeth II? I have not seen any episodes of The Crown, but I've heard very good things about it. Okay, dude, I mean, like, I don't I don't know if it is, like, the sort of television that interests you, and I wasn't sure that it was the sort of television that it would interest me, uh, but Beth definitely, definitely, like, super wanted to watch it, and I was like, all right, well, you know, you're, like, super into it, I'll, I'll, I'll watch it with you. Uh, I got sucked in by the drama. Like, first of all, it's amazingly well done. Like, the entire cast is incredible. Uh, Claire Foy, who I've seen in a number of other things. Like, nothing super big. She's not, like, incredibly famous, but she's a, an amazing actress. Uh, Matt Smith, who, of course, played Doctor Who, is in it. And uh, John Lithgow plays Winston Churchill. Oh, really? Yeah, it's I think it's like the greatest performance I've ever seen, A, out of John Lithgow, and B, like the best Winston, he does the best Winston Churchill I've ever seen. It's incredible. I would not have anticipated that. Yeah, me neither. Like when I saw him on the bill, I was like, John Lithgow, Winston Winston Churchill, really? I consistently forget that I am looking at John Lithgow. Like he's incredible. That that is surprising, and, so, and you know I'm I, I'm a, I'm a Winston Churchill guy. My yeah, my, you are the only person I know who had a picture of Winston Churchill on their graduation cake. Listen, okay, you know I, I don't know if the graduation kids still do it this way. Uh, you know the graduation kids. Uh, maybe you can ask some of yours if you've seen them around, Dave. Um, sure, but I'm going to a graduation party in a couple of weeks. It used to be that 
when you would graduate, you would get a picture, like a photograph of yourself on your cake. Like it would sort of be printed in in frosting, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, they would they like they would print it out and like kind of lay it into the frosting. Uh, it was like really popular for a couple of years. I don't really know if anybody does it still. Right. But I figured, heck, anyone wants to see a picture of me. I'm I'm at the party. Like you can just look at me. That's cool. I'm gonna get somebody else's picture on my cake, and I got Winston Churchill. Dude, he is uh he's he's a pretty cool dude. So yeah, it's uh just like the acting is incredible. And it's it's literally just a a ten episode biopic of the early years of the reign of Queen Elizabeth II. From like the time of like right before the death of her father and her and into her coronation and into like the first couple like two ish two or three years of her reign and uh, and it's just incredible. There's like all this crazy drama and like uh, you know you don't think about you don't think about the queen as like I know this is crazy but like as like a person it's like oh it's just it's the Queen of England like Queen Elizabeth the second right yeah she seems she's cool. Uh, but you know, like there's all sorts of stuff, and like it's like this really intense thing. Um, and they just like they delve into like a lot of detail. And for me, since like I don't actually know a whole lot of like the detailed history, because I'm not like a, you know, like some people are like super into the royals. Like I'm not super into the royals. Oh yeah. Um, and so I don't know all the details of all the stuff that's happening. And so for me, like it's all a surprise. <laughs> It's like, oh man, what's going to happen to Princess Margaret? I don't know. It's just like watching a TV show. But yeah, it's it's amazing. It's super, super well done. Uh, I definitely recommend watching it. And uh, I did see on the internet that there that apparently the queen herself like really digs the show. Oh, that's like, cool. Like she has watched it. She has watched it, and she and she likes it, which is also it's very weird. Uh, to be watching it because it is like definitely a biopic, but it's totally about somebody like the people who are in it are not all of them, of course, but like the people who are in it are definitely still alive. <laughs> yeah. And so that's like, I don't know. That just feels a little bit strange. Like I feel, I feel like I would be a little weirded out by watching someone who made like a biopic of my life, but then I'm not the queen. Like I don't live, I don't live my life in the public sphere, uh, really, outside of, uh, well, like, okay, I, I, in a way I do, because I do this podcast and I tell you people about my lives, but it would be, yeah, it would be weird. So, uh, yeah, so The Crown, I just have been watching it, we just finished it, it's super, super good. Right, what, dude. Matt, is our fifth star fifth of the week? star of the week, dude, is another British thing. Okay, um, Britain's cool. So, this past week has marked the 50th anniversary of the original release of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the, uh, oh, the Beatles yeah. album. You've probably heard of it if you're alive. Um, yeah, it rings a bell, I think. Yeah. Um, and so the... and Okay, I'm going to go into like a brief Beatles nerdery moment. If you already are like really into the Beatles, you probably already know this. And if you're not, you might not care, but I'm saying it anyway because it's my show. Um, well, it's, yeah, it's our show. But yeah. I know that you also care about this. Anyway, um, the original mixes for Sgt. Pepper's and, all, and for most of the uh, Beatles albums initially um, prioritized the mono recording as opposed to the stereo recording. Okay. And so George Martin, sure. the producer who worked on most of those old albums... He, you know, like he would spend weeks working on the mono mixes, like he would be working with the band and doing all this stuff to like really make sure that the mono mixes sounded great because that was what was more prevalent at the time. And then when it came Mm -hmm. time to do the stereo mixes, he just, you know, he took a couple of days and knocked it out. And so as time has progressed, though, the stereo mixes are what more people have listened to because... More people listen to things in stereo than in mono, right? Yeah. So if the what most people listen to when they listen to Sgt. Pepper's is this sort of like crummy mix that they never really and like you know had put like a ton of yeah, work exactly. into. Um, and so for the 50th anniversary, George Martin's son, who he like, because George Martin uh, passed away a few years ago, but George Martin's son oh, okay. Giles, who like the two of them worked together on a bunch of projects previously. 
he sat down and he re like the, they still have apparently like all the original master tracks no kidding yeah. okay so he, like from scratch remixed for stereo the entire album and like also added some uh like if you go to itunes and buy like the deluxe version of this album and i i know there are even larger versions that you could get if you like buy the vinyl but there's like a whole second cd of like alternate takes and just instrumental versions and stuff and listen okay I said this on Twitter, and I know that the last thing anyone needs is, like, a dude telling you to, like, really listen to the Beatles. But, like, okay, for real, if you've never listened to this album, you should listen to if it. Because somehow it's Sergeant Pepper's, you have never heard like, this if album. If you've never listened to it, you should listen to it, because you just ought to. If it's been a long time since you've listened to it, this is a good opportunity to revisit it. And if you've listened to it, like, a thousand times... Like, just give the internet $15 because you get to kind of listen to the album for the first time again. Uh, and that is a very reasonable price for that experience. Because, like, dude, I've sp been spending a lot of time listening to this album. And, like, I'm not a spend a lot of time listening to albums guy. But it's very, very good, Dave. It's very good. It really pops, like, in ways that previously it did not like lovely rita is kind of like a banging song in a way that it wasn't previously like the drums and the bass really hit in a way that you didn't hear before anyway i don't okay, know man. Enough well about no music. you've intrigued me yeah, i don't really like you've successfully okay. <laughs> oh and also <laughs> you also, sold me on this experience importantly in that like second cd because the songs were originally written for Sgt. Pepper's, although they were released as a single and then eventually as part of Magical Mystery Tour, um, Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane were also remixed for this. Ooh, nice. I love those songs. Yeah, they're great. I mean, everybody loves them. Anyway, fun. so go do it. Go listen to Sgt. Pepper's. It's streaming on many of your streaming services, or you can buy it. Um, it's very good. It's not even my favorite Beatles album, but they, you know... This is just what they did with this one, and I wish they would do it with more of them. So you should go listen to it. Dave. Matt. You know what else is great? Uh, yes, it's... No, it's Ninja Sentai. Yeah, and we're going to go watch it. It's episode 36. It's the Hooligan Ninja, and we will be right back. Ninja, Ninja! All right, welcome back. So we have just finished watching episode 36, the Hooligan Ninja. Um... This rules. I loved this episode. I yeah. love this show. <laughs> um, yeah, I was a little bit concerned that we were not going to get what this episode, that we were not ultimately going to get what this episode did end up effectively giving us. And uh, and so I'm stoked that we did, that we did in fact get it. Okay, so this episode begins. I knew, because I... Oh, no, 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 go, 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 mm -hmm. go, go. Oh, oh, I was just going to say that I had watched the, like, next time on Kaku Ranger preview at the end of the last episode. And oh, so I, I knew this guy was coming. Got it. See, I never watch those. Just because, ah. like, oh, we're going to want, like, I just know I'm going to watch it next week. And so, and so I always, I actually actively avoid watching them. Well, the thing is that I, I knew that we weren't watching it next week because I was going to Sweden. And so I was really curious what was coming up. So I watched it and I saw that it was the first episode with this dude. Uh, who we will get to very shortly. And I was like, very, very excited. And I have been anticipating it for some time. <laughs> okay, so as this episode opens up, what we get is a voiceover. And at first I thought it was Daimo. I don't think it actually is. I think it's just like a uh, dude. And it is saying that I did write it down that it says, he is coming after 1,000 years in exile. He is returning to Earth in a meteor, Ninja Man. That's right. Yeah. And then we Ninja see Man. then we see this meteor and it is like hurtling towards Earth. We also see at the same time uh the yokai strategist Takamenro, who as you may recall is Surikime's dad, yes, running through the woods. It's not exactly clear like what what he's doing, but he like he sees the meteor coming in, and then he like drops down to a knee and he shoots. He pulls out a bow and arrow. This is totally red, and he like pulls the 
bowstring back and like an energy arrow appears in the bow and then he launches it and then it like shoots into the sky and then and then we cut away from him. Oh, no, no, wait. Sorry. There was something super important that I forgot. Uh, he has tied a little message. He's tied a little message to this arrow. Yes. So he runs off. We cut to our heroes, the Kaku Rangers who are driving around inside Nekomaru singing a song about Nekomaru to Nekomaru. In Nekomaru. In Nekomaru, yes. Yeah, so... It's a very <laughs> Nekomaru heavy moment. And I really love this because, like, this is just these five teens just chilling on a road trip. You're like, yeah, of course they would have come up with some dumb song about their cat car. <laughs> um, so they're singing uh, this arrow lands from it, this arrow. This is really cool. This like it shoots out of the sky. Like it's not sh- clear if it teleported there or if you just shot it from like way super far away. But this energy arrow, it like shoots in and it and it lands in the back of Nakamaru. And Nekimaru, now if he were just a van, of course, like it wouldn't matter because it would just, but it's not. He's like a magical cat truck. And so Nekimaru, I guess, right. feels pain. And it just pain. got in the butt with an arrow. Yeah, it's we've never covered this, but apparently Nekimaru does in fact feel pain, uh, which I feel like maybe should have come up in the past at some point, but whatever. So he, Nekimaru, kind of like veers off to the side. And they run around back and they're like, what the heck? What's up with this arrow? And Sasuke sees it, sees the arrow, and he's like, oh, there's a message on this arrow. That's super weird. And then there's an earthquake. Quake? Earthquake. Not an earthquake. There's an earthquake, and then the uh, this meteor hits. The meteor hits the ground. <laughs> Giant explosion. Yeah, I think those things probably happen in, a, in the opposite order, if I were to guess. Listen, Matt, uh, my notes say earthquake, then meteor, and this is... It's like, listen, if it were any other show, I would assume that somehow my notes were wrong. It's Ninja Sentai Cocker Ranger. I see absolutely no reason why the earthquake can't precede the meteor that presumably is causing the earthquake, dude. There's no, you know, maybe just the camera is is shaking. Maybe just the camera is shaking because it's like there's a meteor coming and that makes a camera shake for some reason. Um, well, we uh, listen, if there's one thing I know about cameras, they are terrified of meteors. They're just straight petrified of a me- <laughs> of meteors. Okay, so anyway, the meteor lands, there's an explosion. Yep. Um, and you see a like what we will find out is like a magic jar flying out of the explosion. Yeah, and it says, I he, he cries, he says something like, hooray, I'm back, like the hooligan ninja, like, that's me, ninja man. And this is, of course, the title of the episode. So, Saizo then kind of peeks out from beside, behind Nakamaro. He's very nervous, for reasons I don't understand. So no, okay, is the he, only... He, he thought that it was the end of the world. That, I mean, that's literally what he says. He pops out from behind the truck and says, oh my gosh, I thought this was the end of the world. Oh, you know what? I, mi- <laughs> I missed that. All right. Well, Saizo, if that's what you thought, I guess that's a, a reasonable reason to be scared. And so honestly, Sa- okay. Now, <laughs> normally I would say, Saizo, you should chill. But on the other hand, like, they know that Daimao is free and that, like, Daimao getting free was the thing that they were worried was going to end the world. So at this point, kind of any major thing that they see, it's entirely reasonable to assume like, oh, well, I guess this is it. This is it, man. They're just they're just on edge. All right, I'll give you that one, Saizo. Uh, so in the face of all this, though, Sasuke is the only one with the presence of mind to actually read this weird note that they've gotten. And what he reads is the note, it's, it's anonymous. We, of course, know that it's from Hakamenro, the yokai strategist. And it says, listen, Daimao is after Ninja Man... Not to kill him, but to, like, get him on side. To, like, get Ninja Man to join the yokai and become evil. So, this, like, this, first of all, is actually a pretty huge plot point. Not necessarily about Ninja Man, but the fact that Hakamenro is the one that sent this note. Because the last time we saw this dude, all we, like, we guessed, like, yeah, probably he actually is still a good guy. But... He, there was no actual, like, that was totally just guessing based on, like, sort of the structure of Sentai shows and the way that their narratives normally play out. There was no clue that Hakamenro was, in fact, 
sort of still a good guy. Like there was a brief exchange with Sandayu, which like may have led us there. But but Hunkamander was like definitely on the bad dude's side. So the fact that he is now told the Conquer Rangers, like, hey, you have to go help Ninja Man, because like Daimo is doing this thing, blah, blah, blah. We do have it confirmed now that Yes. That yes, Hakamandro is is still a good dude, which is great, because he's sooner he may is dead. Right, that would have been a real bummer later in the series, otherwise. <laughs> I mean, listen, yeah, some sucked. bummer stuff is still probably going to happen at some point in this show, you know, based on my experience of watching these television programs, but at least that's not one of them. Yeah. So we cut away from there over to Daimao's, like, haunted mansion. Yes. Um, he is questioning Hakamenro, because Hakamenro has obviously been, like, out and about. And said, like, hey, dude, um, you're my evil strategist. Where have you been? What have you been up to? And Hakamenru, instead of coming up with some crazy lie, or even a lie at all, well, I guess this is a lie, just looks to Daimai and says, oh, nothing. Like, I haven't <laughs> been doing anything. <laughs> so is that Daimai's like, okay. Daimu completely accepts. He accepts this. Like, that's like, fine that with him. Fair. So like, listen, man, uh, you're okay strategist. It's a busy guy. You get, you got to have some downtime sometime, right? I'm glad. I'm glad you got that little break, Hakamenro, because <laughs> we're going to kill dudes later. In fact, here's how we're going to kill dudes. So you know, and I know, I'm. this is Daimao speaking now, uh, that Ninja Man just landed. So yes. I want you, Hakamenro, to go find him, like go to the crater, find the jar that he's in, and I need you personally to smash open the jar and bring him back here so that we can get him to work for us. It has to be you because only a member of the Tsurihime bloodline is able to smash the jar. Yes. And he says, so that only leaves you and like you and your daughter. Like you're the only people who can do that. Right. Um, and Hakamaru why- says like, um, doesn't this dude like really hate you? And Daimao's only response is like, yeah, but, like, we we could deal with that. He says, yeah, but, like, if we're the ones who let him out, like, it'll be cool. So, hey, Matt, why why was it that only somebody from the Tsurihime can open this this jar? What was the reason for that? Um, Because there's only one family that has two characters from it in this show i assume trick question trick question man there's no reason it's just that's just the way it is hooray (laughs) no reason whatsoever given in this episode and like man it would have taken like it would have taken like three seconds like oh you're the only ones who can do it because a thousand years ago it was your family that sealed them up like that's all i needed i just like that tiny like that one line it would have taken no time at all uh, I'm just going to pretend. I'm headcanoning that one. It was the Surihime family that sealed him up, and that is why it's one of them that can do it. So that's the deal. Sure. So we cut away Easy from there. enough. Yeah. So we cut away from there, and just some kids, just like these two kids find the seal bottle, and they just like, it's in like a little river or something. Then they pick it up, and Ninja Man says, hey, Great. I'm like super stoked to be back on Earth. Uh, Ninja Man is a total bro, by the way. He's amazing. Ninja Man is a complete goofball. Yeah, he's like, he totally it. rules. Now, and, oh, by the way, so Ninja Man, Dave, do you want to take a moment to describe the look of Ninja Man? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So Ninja Man is not like he is a he is a dude, kind of. He looks. Okay. So if I told you to imagine like a suit of ninja power armor, like that's what Ninja Man looks like. Yeah, Ninja Man looks like an action figure. Yes. Like he's very obviously, like just he's a straight up an action figure. Uh, he right. looks like an action figure, like power, power. He looks like a Ninja Man. Like that's, he's he's Ninja yeah. Man. <laughs> he's got an N on his chest. Like Yeah. Oh, so if, if you are a Power Rangers um, aficionado, as I know many of you are, this is Ninjor. Ninjor from Power Rangers is the suit that was Ninja Man. Oh, Ninjor, okay. Dave, is like an ally of Zordon's who was the source of the ninja powers. And I think also built the Zords or like created the power coins or something. Uh, There's a lot yeah, of weird that, stuff going on That with sounds familiar. I've heard Matt and Michael, I think, talk about Ninjor, so... Yeah, so uh, this, yeah, okay, cool. 
This is Ninjor. So Ninja Man looks up out of the bottle because like he's not uh he's not like physically trapped in the, I mean he is physically trapped in there, but it's pretty clear that he could probably get out like physically, so he's mystically sealed in there. And he looks up at the kids and he says, Hey, uh, could you please let me out of this bottle? And I was really, really proud of these kids. I don't think we ever get a name for the brother. Their sister's name is Mitsuko. Oh, we, really... we actually we do get a name for the brother later in the episode. I have it written down. It is Junichi. Okay, thank you. So it's Junichi and Mitsuko, and uh, I'm super proud of these two because instead of instead of like every other child I've ever seen in a Super Sentai show, just saying like, yeah, of course, let's let you out. They do take the time to ask who he is first. <laughs> He's like, let yes. me out. They're like, well, who are you, and why are you trapped in a bottle? <laughs> Which Great job. Great job, kids. Thank you yeah. for asking those questions because nobody Someone's ever asked. Someone's been watching the show. Yeah. And so what he says, he says, listen, uh, he says, no, 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 I'm a good guy. They're, like, they're not super deep on their questioning. He just says, like, I'm a good guy and that's enough. And he says, listen, there's a jar. Like, the, the jar is shaped like a, um, it's like a face and there's a mouth. And in the mouth is a hammer. It's like biting a hammer. And he says, listen, there's a hammer on the outside of this bottle. Take the hammer, smash the bottle. It'd be good. They try to take the hammer out. They, of course, can't do it. Dramatic well, irony. They're not, yeah, they're not we, worthy. The, yeah, no. Uh, we, the audience, know something that the kids do not know is that they're not members of the Tsuruhime family. Side note, Matt. I saw something the other day. It was like this internet musing about... I forget where it was from. But it was somebody talking about, like, Mr. Rogers picking up the hammer of Thor and, like how he totally would have been able to do it, which like, listen, I love Mr. Rogers, but that's nonsense. Being worthy of the power of Thor doesn't mean like you're pure of heart. It means that you'd be like a really excellent Thor, which Mr. Rogers would not. Right. Like there's a lot of good dudes who can't pick up who Thor's can't, hammer. Yeah. Anyways, like Captain America can pick up that dude's super pure of heart. Anyways. Uh, so they try to pick, which I wouldn't have mentioned, but you talked about Thor. So hey, listen. they can't do it. Okay. Now you, there is a hammer that they can't pick up because they're like not mystically able to do so. I didn't just pull that one out of a hat. <laughs> so, but they can't do it. And he says, "Ah, oh, my sin hasn't been forgiven." Like I, because we don't know why he's stuck in this thing yet, but he obviously does. He says, "My sins haven't been forgiven. I can't get out." And so the little girl's like, "Well, I can help a little bit." And she pulls out this cookie and she like breaks it in half and drops it into the jar. And then there's a really cool thing because. Ninja Man obviously is like a full size person, and uh, they have just made like giant cookie halves. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they drop I, it on him. I loved this. And uh, so now, he I don't says, know "If he eats them, or if he is able to eat them, because he has like you know like a helmet face. He doesn't have like a human face with a mouth." Well, it's not totally clear like what Ninja Man's like species is. Like we don't know if he's a human. He could just be like a. He could just be a ninja man. Like, I don't know. Right. And uh, A ninja man from the planet Ninja. Yeah, he's just, he's a ninja man from the planet Ninja. It's right next to the Puma planet, where Puma Man's from. And planet Spider, where and, uh, the Japanese Spider-Man gets his powers from. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And also a, the planet Draculon, where Vampira is from. Or Vampira? I think Vampira. Anyway, Vampira's from the planet Draculon, and all their Vam water is blood. It's amazing. Vampirella? Oh, Vampirella, right. I think it's anyway, Vampirella. Listen. Uh, anyways, so <laughs> the just, little girl I, I says... Was, I spent a lot of time in airports yesterday. Dave, the brain's still a little... Need to reboot it. Yep. No, 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 man. No no judgment here. I'm fuzzy myself. Uh, there's two tiny humans that constantly demand attention. So... But I'm the glad that despite those things, eventually we were able to remember, together at least, the fact that Vampirella is from the planet Draculon, where all the water is blood. Yeah, I know literally. Here's what I know about Vampirella, her name, and I recognize um, her costume. Like those are the things that I know about Vampirella. I I knew a second thing about Vampirella, and I have already told it to you. Um, so the little girl, she like he thanks her for the cookie, and she says, "Oh well, mother says that you always need to be kind to small, fragile creatures." And Ninja Man is like really offended by this. Because he's like, hey, I'm not actually this size, and I am also not frail. 
Right, but like, like I am no an amazing superhero because at the moment he is actually like at least as she can see him in the jar, he is a very tiny boy. Yes, he is the tiniest man, uh, tiniest ninja man. So as Ninja Man is like mid rant, I guess he falls over. We don't know why. We pop outside. We see that the girl and the Mitsuko who is holding the jar and her brother they're running away from Dorodoros who are chasing them to try and get this jar because of course remember, Daimu wants a jar. Yes, so they are running away, and the uh, die range, the die rangers. Listen, I told you, I spent a lot of time traveling yesterday. We're we're all working through this together, folks. The Kaku Rangers appear. You know, the heroes of this television show that is called Kaku Ranger. The Kaku <laughs> Rangers appear. <laughs> they throw some cal drops. The Dorodoros run on top of them like a bunch of idiots that don't have eyes or something. Um, their feet hurt, and so they run away. Yeah, so they have saved the kids. Uh, hooray! Great job. Well, they, they have saved them for, like, a moment. Because yes. they turn around to tell the kids, like, hey, we're here to save you, because we're friendly folks. And then all of a sudden, a building that is nearby explodes, and the heroes and the children are buried in rubble, except that they're not. Because right. the rubble immediately fades away and everything is okay. Yes. Uh, and then they are hit by a phantom train. And they freak out for a second. But then, of course, they're fine because it's an illusion. And Dude, this is why I was thinking about Die Ranger because that's a total Daigo move. Total Daigo move. Uh, so the monster appears and it's Bakuki. And he is a yokai of nightmares and illusions that he uses to kill people. And uh, he's basically mastermind. Like, that's his deal. He is mastermind. He can create, like, super powerful illusions that affect people and they, like, freak out. Yeah, he's got a cool look, but it's a very, like, it definitely looks like he's, a, like, a, a mini boss from Final Fantasy IX. Yeah, he's like, like that a... specific kind of fantasy look. Yeah, it's, he's got, a, he's like got a, kind like of like a, a weird squid head. head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure, like long pointy fingers, and then like sort of like a it's got a shoulder thing going on, and like a long roby deal, you know the yeah. shoulder things in the roby deals. Yeah, 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 he's cool, and so he is like attacking them with with illusions, and he like immediately plunges them into this like total illusory world. They're like running around. The, it's actually pretty cool because it gives them an, an opportunity to like, it's the one time that I was not like bothered by the totally random scene shifts because they've explained it. It's like, oh, the whole thing is just an illusion. So the rangers are like running around streets and they're being chased by Yakuza members maybe? Just, like, okay, I, I think they're supposed to look like gangsters of some sort, but for all the world it looks like they're being chased by the Blues Brothers. <laughs> Like, they've got those same sort of, like, ill-fitting suits and ties and sunglasses and hats. Like, it just looks like they're being chased by the, like, the Japanese Blues Brothers who have guns. Oh, by the way, by this point, um, Mitsuko has been, like, snatched away by Bakuki. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Because he has, she like... has the seal jar. Oh, yes. Thank you, man. I totally forgotten to mention that. Uh, so as they are like running around in this illusion, they run into an alley and there's like a door there and they fall through the door and then they're on a beach and then they are attacked by shadow, shadow rangers, like shadow versions of themselves unhanged. Yes. I and... think that's a cool touch because instead of just having evil, like, you know, evil doubles in the ranger costumes... Since they are already transformed, and so, you know, the actors playing the Kaku Rangers are available to do other stuff since they're not in the suits, like, they have them dressed up. Well, okay, they look exactly the same, except they have an evil smile on their face, and they're all wearing, like, really intense eyeliner. Yeah, uh, which I thought was, you know, they didn't have goatees. They had, no, nah, it was cool. So, they the actual rangers go down like they are defeated by their shadow selves but it's not like really clear how much damage is actually being done but they are definitely like kind of down and out of this fight at least so bakuki t- grabs the jar from the little girl mitsuko and uh, but this little girl mitsuko she like she's a baller dude she just keeps fighting bakuki she's like punching this giant monster in his chest, like, trying to get this thing. Yeah, because uh, at this point, she is no longer being held by the monster. Like, he has let her go, but instead of running to safety, she just turns around and starts punching this thing in the stomach. Yeah, it was rad. Uh, so Ninja Man cannot get out of the jar, but he can... 
there is an opening and he could launch fire out of it, which he does. So he turns his jar prison into like a flamethrower, blasts Bakuki with his blast of with with fire. Bakuki like freaks out and like like drop throws the jar. And I think now, Surahime there, there's gets a very her hands good on reason it. why he freaks out and throws the jar when he gets hit in the face with fire. Because normally, because that's a get, reasonable well, reaction okay. to getting hit in the face with fire. Yes, but specifically, because normally, like, listen, people get like hit with explosions and fire and stuff all the time in this show, and they just sort of like get up and brush themselves off. Um, but if you look very closely, Bakuki's dang eye is on fire. In this scene, like oh, it catches geez. the suit's eye on fire, and then as when we see Bakuki later in this episode, like anytime we see him from here on out, he is wearing an eye patch because Ninja Man burned the eye out of his head. I did, man. That's I did not catch that like thing. That's pretty rad. Yeah, it's uh, great. Ninja nice, Man is not kidding around. <laughs> nice continuity work, Ninja Sentai Kage Ranger. Like, great job. So. Now, Tsuruhime has the jar, but Bakuki does manage to get his hands back on Mitsuko. So, like, the illusions are all gone now. It's just, like, Ranger staring down Bakuki, and he says, listen. He, like, he teleports away, but he, like, uses, he projects his voice, and he says, listen, you bring the girl to Hell Valley, and with that, or you bring the jar, rather, to Hell Valley, and I will trade you the jar for, for Mitsuko. Like, that's the deal. And then he's out. Yes. Uh, this is the break in the episode. When we come back, uh, the brother, Junichi, is sitting there holding the Ninja Man jar and crying because he's very sad that his sister has been taken. Yeah, which, you know. And Ninja legit. Man is saying, like, man, I really, I really wish that I could get out and that I could help. Because if I was free from this jar, you know, I'd just punch Makuki in the face. It's great. Like, I'm an awesome Ninja Man. Yeah, like, we would be good. Um, and, and then, then the Cocker Rangers ap- approach where Junichi is sitting, and they say, so Ninja Man, why are you in that jar? Like, yeah, what, like is the, what? what is the deal? What's your whole deal there? And he says, well, like a thousand years ago, I was the God General's apprentice, which is the one thing that makes me think that, like, maybe he's not human. Like, I'm not sure what he is, but, like, the three God Generals aren't human. So well, I don't know what the were, deal is. Though. Remember they were humans? Like when you see Oh, old, that's like, right. The, but the they scrolls? got robot bodies or something. Okay, so I don't know what's up with, with him. Maybe he was also a human that like studied with them until he was enlightened enough to be gifted a robot body. I really don't know. Could that is Matt, that is such a beautiful sentence. A because it was perfectly described <laughs> what was going on. And B, because I feel like it could not exist in any context outside of Super Sentai. Like, not necessarily Kaku Ranger, but at least the Sentai series. So he says, listen, I was originally the apprentice of the three god generals, but I got tricked by Daimu. And we see, like, a quick flashback, and Daimu, like, runs up as disguised as a person and says, Ninja Man, all the yokai are disguised as people. And... Ninja Man just says, and I hurt a lot of people. I think we can read that as like maim slash killed a bunch of people. Yeah, thinking that we they were the yokai. See is that like Daimao runs away and like hides behind a rock and turns back into Daimao so that like we know beyond the shadow of a doubt, like this is what is happening. And then we watch Ninja Man just like cut down a bunch of dudes who he thinks are yokai. Yeah. And so as a punishment for this, he is like banished in this jar into space for a thousand years, presumably by the God Generals. So yes. as he now finishes telling the story. Can, can I real no. quick say what is crazy about this? Hit it. Uh, this is that's the plot of Old Man Logan. Oh, yeah. Totally like if you ever is, read Old Man Logan. Uh, no, I haven't, but I've picked up on a big parts of it because like old man Logan is the Wolverine now in, he's not Wolverine, he's Logan because X-23 is Wolverine now. Right, but. It's, it's all very weird. But if you have ever read the original like Mark Miller old man Logan story, the reason that he has like exiled himself to the desert is that Mysterio like tricked him into murdering the rest of the X-Men. Well, there is like, I'm, I think they reference that like pretty obliquely, but in in the movie Logan, 
Oh, which I have still not seen. Oh, dude, you gotta see that movie. Okay, but, listen, yeah. we, we are we, no, we are we spiraling spiraling out of control here, away from the episode. Yeah, I was uh, just watching it and I realized, like, oh, this uh, is that same at. plot. So I just wanted to mention it. Okay, so likelihood that Mark Miller ripped it off. Oh, huh. very low, very low, very low. Okay. So anyways. I mean, uh, listen, I, I'm not a big Mark Miller fan, but I don't think that he stole this plot point <laughs> from Cocker Ranger. So he says, listen, uh, that's the deal. So Ed, when he finishes telling this story, the hammer that's on the outside of the jar and Tsurukime both begin to glow. She grabs the hammer and he's like, oh man, you can you can free me. This is amazing. She's like, yes, we're going to get you free. We're going to go fun- punch Pakuki in the face. And he says, wait, 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 stop. He says, listen. The deal, if you don't bring me, Bakuki will probably kill Mitsuko. She risked her life for me. I'm going to do the same for her. Like, just bring me to Bakuki and we'll, like, we'll figure it out from there. Yes, because Which, Ninja Man, as it turns out, I'm, like, he's a goofball, but he is a solid dude. I was going to say, Ninja Man, stand-up dude. Uh, so, next scene, it's Nekamaro and the Rangers at the quarry, which is, I guess, Hell Valley. Uh, they are in their full ninja costumes, which is rad. Okay, I, I know I keep interrupting, but I got to say something about this. He said, come to Hell Valley, right? And they show yeah. up to the same quarry that we have seen the entire show and for every other show. Like, I can't imagine it's that many quarries. It always looks the same. So that that leads me with to one of two things. Either this is a quarry, the name of which is Hell Valley. This is a Hell Valley um, that is actually like an evil valley that they have just been coming to the entire time and never referencing the fact that it was anything other than a regular quarry. And I don't know which option is weirder. Yeah, there's no great answer to that. Uh, anyway, I'm I mean, going to go the with the eternal quarry question, and I don't think we're ever going like, to get yeah, satisfied. No, Matt, we just but need to recognize. Such, yeah, it's just an interesting wrinkle in the question, so I, I wanted to mention it. So, Bakuki <laughs> so is hidden someplace. He's an illusion guy, whatever. He's hidden someplace, and he's like taunting them. They're like, where are you? And he's like, I'll never tell. And then a door appears, and uh, the rangers are... It appears that they are turned into energy and sucked into this door. Probably just an illusion, but whatever. And then this is totally cool. What he has done is he says, you are now in the Bakuki Illusion Theater. And it's like, it looks as though they are in this theater and he is up on a screen, like outside of this place, like in Hell Valley in the quarry. And he's got Mitsuko and they see him up on the screen, like looking out. And so he demands the jar. He says, give me the jar. Tsuruhime puts it like on this little pedestal thing. And then he reaches through the screen to grab the jar. It's a cool effect. It's a cool moment. And then as soon as he has his hand on the jar, the rangers henge, and then they attack the screen. Somehow this shatters the illusion, and then they kaku laser Bakuki. Like, they just blast him in the face. Yeah, so, it, like, they turn this around on him very quickly. Because when they shoot him in the face, he drops the jar and the girl. And now the fight is just... A regular fight. Like, okay, there was this well, really listen, amazing man. moment in a movie theater where a guy is reaching through an illusion screen, and now we're just fighting in the quarry again. Listen, man, uh, Daigo is like the one crazy exception to the illusionists are wimps rule. But that's the rule. Like, you're an illusionist, and like, you get illusion powers because you can't actually fight. Like, Mastermind can't actually fight. Mysterio can't actually fight. Like, that's the whole thing. That's why you have illusion powers. Yeah, that's true. Okay. So, ex- again, except, of course, for Daigo. So, they now have, like, J- what, what's the brother's name again? Junichi? Junichi? Jun- uh, Junichi. Junichi. So, Junichi runs over, like, he grabs Mitsuko, like, they're back in Nekamaro, they're safe. Surahime grabs the jar. She. So, now that the kids are safe, we're in a fight. Most of the team are fighting Doradoras. Surahime is fighting Bakuki. They're sort of fighting over the jar, and Bakuki actually seems like he's about to get the better of her, right? Like, he's got a sword, right. like, to her neck. And then all of a sudden, from over the ridge, we see uh, her father, the yokai strategist, Takumenro. Yes. And, like, as it looks like Tsuruhime is going to go down, he 
like real because like nobody I think catches that he does this like not even Suruhime, yeah, but I don't he think does. Anyone knows that he's there, right? But he uses that same energy bow from the beginning of the episode to blast Bakuki. So Bakuki is like knocked back, and he says, "Forget all of this. Like this sucks. I'm just gonna grow and smash you all." Right. So in the time that it takes him to enact his like giantism attack. Tsuruhime does manage to, like, she gets the jar, she grabs the hammer, she smashes it. Ninja Man is free. And uh, Ninja Man is apparently, like, his default is giant, because he just appears and is a giant. Yes, there is no growing for him. Like, the, the, the jar is smashed, and now he is a giant Ninja Man. Yes. And so, this is, the, this is maybe my favorite line of this whole thing. He says, ah, oh, he, like, stretches out, he does some kicks. And then he says, after a thousand years, it's time for a rampage. Dude, he's he's mad. Uh, not as mad as he's going to get, but he flies in on a giant cloud. He has like, that is his mode of transportation. He flies yes. on it. He like stands on it. And he's then got, he's, he's like... He's got a Goku cloud. Yeah, he's got a Goku cloud. Um, And so he like flies around um, and with like a sword. And he's like doing like sword flybys basically. Yeah, and Bakuki will, like, try to hit him, but then all of a sudden, Ninja Man has, like, teleported and is, like, lounging across the field, like, making fun of him and taunting him over there. Like, stuff goes very well for Ninja Man for a minute, and then Bakuki goes back into, like, his illusion realm. Yes, and uh, he he manages, like, he... However, it is that he attacks. Like he attacks Ninja Man with his with his illusion, and uh, Ninja Man four ninjas that appear to attack him. Yeah, and so he's getting like hit and like disoriented by these ninjas. And then there's like a really cool moment where the ninjas all kind of line up, and then they sort of merge, and it's Bakuki again. And now that Ninja Man is disoriented from the illusion, Bakuki is going to go in for the final blow himself, and he says, "Ha." Right. You weren't even that tough. You're just kind of like a novice. How dare you try to fight me? And Ninja Man says, hold up. Did you just call me a novice? Did you just say that like I didn't know my stuff? And he, I think he literally says, rage out. <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry. He says, anger explosion. He yes, says, anger explosion. Anger explosion. <laughs> yeah, anger explosion. And uh, Ninja Man transforms into Samurai Man. Like, he does, like, a little, it's an action figure transformation. Like, the head flips around from the, like, like, his head is on a swivel. Like, and it, like, folds down into his chest, and another head comes up out of his back, and then, like, his shoulder pads kick up, and he's Samurai Man now. Yes, and he has, like, like attached his sword to the end of his scabbard, and now it is a spear. Yes, uh, it's a super wobbly spear. Yeah, it's it, not super well constructed, but it looks cool. Yeah, <laughs> there's just a couple of shots where you see, like, after he's hit someone, it's just going like, whoop, 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 whoop. and uh, so he like he like just wrecks Bakuki for like, a second, and then the Rangers like sensing Bakuki's weakness summon Super Kakure Dai Shogun. This is a cool moment because uh, when Super Kakure Dai Shogun appears. Ninja Man, of course, does not think of ninja of Kakure Daishogun primarily as like a giant punch bot, but as his like master. Yeah, because like, of course he had apprentice the three god generals right there. Right, so he's just like, oh, master, like it's so good to see you. This is incredible. Uh, which I thought was a cool moment. So then, uh, Samurai slash Ninja Man does the Samurai Rage Bomber, which is a Hadoken, and then. Uh, oh, and, and then, and then we finish things up with the flying iron fist. Oh yeah, yeah, flying iron fist. So think, by the way, have dies. we talked about the fact that it's kind of weird that the uh, the finishing move of Super Kakare Dai Shogun um, is like does not involve a sword? We haven't like, talked even about a little it, bit, but it is weird. It is kind of, like it's great. Like you, you know, like there's this big monkey face that appears on the the screen and then he gets punched with an energy fist and he flies back. Yeah. And but like, it's a, a cool moment that there's no sword involved. Yeah. I actually hadn't, that is weird, but it these, works. You know, these are the observations that you get when we've been away for a week and really had time to mull on things. <laughs> like we need a little distance to realize like, Oh, that's a little bit weird that it doesn't, we were so entranced by the giant monkey fest. <laughs> Imagine how weird this show would look if we didn't watch it for two weeks. 
<laughs> I don't know if we could return to it, Matt. I feel like if we got out, it would be like it would be very, very difficult to get back in. So Bakugi dies, and then Daimu sort of like appears in a phantasm in the sky, and he says, I I and I will get you, Ninja Man. Like, not get you like I'll kill you. Not like I'll get you next time, gadget. Get you like I'll get you on my side, and you will be evil too. And you'll kill the Cocker I, I will employ me. you. We have reasonable benefits. <laughs> so, uh, so the next thing we see is uh, it's Sasuke. The Rangers are on Hangade. It's Sasuke. He's like, man, I wonder what Daimo's plan could be. Where's Ninja Man? Oh, he's just always giant, like we said. And he's uh, he's got the kids, Junichi and uh, Mitsuko, in his hand. And he's just like flying them around in his giant cloud. As a way yeah, to say, like, like, hey, thanks, thank you for like you know risking yourselves to save me. As a brief token of my thanks, I'm just gonna fly you around for a while, and it's gonna be fun. Right, it's gonna be cool. And the kids are like super into it because it is. It's cool. They're being held in the hand of like a giant ninja man who is like has like a cloud, cloud trapeze, a cloud chariot that he flies them around in. And then that's it, man. That's the episode. Yeah, that's the episode. Uh, so I love Ninja Man, and I'm really excited that he's here. Yeah, I am actually. I'm really excited because I love the sixth. I love a sixth ranger. I yeah. really, really dig it, and uh, I was a little bit concerned that we weren't going to get one. Uh, I don't think the- I, he's less of a sixth ranger and more of like, I don't know exactly what he is, because he's not a mentor, and he's not a new, like, giant robot. I don't know. I think he's a sixth ranger. Like, that's the slot. He's an in- They're ninjas. He's a ninja. That's the slot he fits in in my head. Uh, so, Matt, where? Where, oh, where? Does Bakuki fit on the Creature Royale? I kind of dig this dude. Like, I dig his thing. Like, I like that he's an illusion monster. Yeah, he's cool. Okay, so do we have any other illusion monsters on here? I think that we do. Let's start from there. I don't know that we really do. There's the Cherry Blossom Viscount who, like, makes people go kind of crazy... And then Copy Empress isn't really like an illusion monster as such. No, man, not really. Okay, wow, that's weird. There's a lot of like, well, there's a lot of like duplicating and copying. And like the mirror monsters could have been illusion monsters, but they weren't. So really it's just Bakuki who's like a straight up mastermind style, like mess with your head illusion monster. So he's pretty unique. Uh, he's got kind of a cool look. He's pretty effective. Now, listen, like, I don't think he's up in, like, the truly, truly, like, upper echelons. Like, you know, he's no apartment. Actually, yeah, he's no apartment building dimension. He's not cooler than, like, Iron Mask Choryu. But I'm, like, yeah, but he's, like, like two, two spots below Iron Mask Choryu is Umibozu, the, like, the water dude. And he's definitely cooler than Umibozu. Yeah. And, okay, so right above Umibozu is... Is Saragami uh, the Ninja Monkey. I think okay, he's so, actually, like, right in there. Like, okay, that's so who do you my, think is cooler? I actually think that, that Bakuki is cooler. Okay, now, before you say that, do remember that Saragami had like a whole like team of Dorodorus that he had trained to pretend to be children so that they could trick the Kaku Rangers into giving up the secret of the Kaku Ranger ball. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Like, so... Bakuki is cool and like he was effective, but like, and he did have that awesome movie theater thing, but he didn't have a cool scheme. And I yeah, want to and... give bonus points for scheme here. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. But I say, dude, like, right under Sarugami. Because okay, he's yeah, definitely so cooler than Umibozu. He's cooler than Kameitachi, the sickle weasel. He's cooler than the Shootin' Doji, Shootin' Doji brothers. Yeah, okay, cool. Well, let's slot him in um, right so that- in between Sarugami and Umibozu at place number 23. Is that it? Yep. Yeah, man. Right Good on. job, Bakuki. So, man, I think that's going to do it for us, yeah? Yes, that is going to do it for another episode of A View to a Cocky Ranger. 
Before we finish up here, I'd like to remind you all you can email the show at supersentibrothers at gmail.com. You want to get any updates on future episodes or check out the things that we're talking about on Twitter, we are at Super Sentai Bros. If you like the show, please remember, shining in the iTunes review section, there are five stars. Uh, if you give us a written review on there, that's going to help new people find the show. Um, for some reason, involving algorithms. The Super Sentai Brothers are a production of Retrograde Orbit Radio. If you'd like to catch any of the other great Retrograde Orbit Radio shows, you can find them all at RetrogradeOrbitRadio.com. Once again, we're the Super Sentai Brothers. I'm Matt. I'm Dave. And we'll see you next week for the greatest show on Earth.